Uh, good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is our COVID-19 briefing for British Columbia for Thursday, June the 17th. We're honored to be here on the territories of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Uh, tomorrow, Friday and Monday, we'll be providing written briefings at 3 o'clock about the COVID-19 pandemic in British Columbia. Dr. Henry and I will next be doing a briefing on the issue on Tuesday uh, and uh, Tuesday of next week, and we'll have more information about that to follow. And with that, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, as of today, we are, have now reached 76.5% uh, of all adults um, being immunized here in British Columbia and 74.8% of everyone 12 years of age and older have now received their first dose of vaccine. So we've delivered 4,231,871 doses of all three COVID-19 vaccines uh, to adults or to people here in British Columbia. And of those, 768,008 are second doses. So we are pleased to see that across the board, first doses continue to progress well. And we've now, as we talked about earlier this week, our health authority teams are using many creative tools to make it as easy as possible for everyone 12 and over to get the vaccine and to protect themselves and their communities and families here in BC. As well, our second doses are accelerating with invitation going out to tens of thousands of people every day now. And those, uh, those clinics are active um, across the province as well. In terms of uh, the transmission of disease in the province, we have 120 new cases today, bringing the total number of people diagnosed with COVID-19 to 146,794 people. Of the new cases, 13 are people who live in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 53 people are in the Fraser Health Region, five people are on the Vancouver Island Health Region, 43 people live in the interior, five in the Northern Health Region, and one is a person who normally resides outside of Canada. We currently have 1,451 active cases, 131 of them uh, in hospital, 44 of those in, uh, people in critical care or ICU, and 143,579 people are now recovered. Sadly, in the last day, we've had one additional person die from COVID-19, a person in their 80s who unfortunately died at the, the outbreak in the Richmond Hospital. Even though that outbreak is over, we know that the impacts can be felt for many weeks after. That leaves uh, 1,739 people we've lost to COVID-19 in British Columbia, and our condolences go out to their families, their communities, and care providers across the province. The outbreak at Charrington Place in Fraser Health is now over, and that leaves us with three active outbreaks in long-term care and assisted living right now. So as I've mentioned, our vaccine program continues to go full speed across the province. I will say today we were notified that there's some upcoming challenges with uh, the delivery of Pfizer vaccines in July. And we, as a result, the supply that we will be receiving in the first two weeks of July is now, we've heard, has, will be reduced. So that is something that, that happens when we're in a, a global pandemic with a global vaccine supply. We know these speed bumps happen, and while disappointing, they're not unexpected given the complexity of the global immunization efforts. So we will continue to work with what we get and be sure that there will be enough vaccine for everyone. And uh, we don't in, uh, expect this to affect our timelines. We hear that the decrease will be in the first two weeks of July and that they will be making up the increase in the last two weeks of July. But it does mean it's a reflection of the challenges that we've had across the board. We know that primarily this has been with Moderna and we've had uh, challenges with shipments. Um, thankfully, very recently, we've uh, had an indication that we're going to get a lot of Moderna starting this week, so that is good news. And we know that both the mRNA vaccines that we have, Moderna and Pfizer, are both equally safe and effective. If you receive the mRNA vaccine for your first dose, 
you will normally and usually be offered the same vaccine for your second dose. And that is our policy across all of our clinics. We do need to recognize, however, that be, sometimes you may be offered the other mRNA vaccine. The vaccines we know are very similar and they're equally effective. We do our best to make sure that both products are available at every clinic. But as I've mentioned, sometimes supply issues when we have this rapid just-in-time response, um, we occasionally do not have the same product available for everybody. Um, as I mentioned, these are both safe and effective and, according to our National Advisory Committee on Immunization, can be considered interchangeable. So that is um, to reassure people that if that occasion happens when they don't have what the initial vaccine that you were uh, given for your dose one, that it is perfectly safe and equally effective to receive one of the other mRNA vaccines, so Pfizer and Moderna. Um, I will also say that the call center agents don't have the information to know which vaccines you will receive at any particular day on any of the clinics. As you know, we were immunizing 60,000 people a day, and it is a very much a, a challenging uh, game in a way to make sure that we have enough vaccine for every clinic with the shipments that are coming in on a periodic basis. So um, just be rest assured that we will do our best to make sure you get the same vaccine that you had for your first dose. But getting two doses of the vaccine is important for all of the vaccines that we have here in the province, and we encourage everybody to get that second dose as soon as it's available to you. As well today, uh, the National Advisory Committee uh, provided some updated guidance based on expert opinion around mixing and matching of different types of vaccines. So this is particularly around the AstraZeneca vaccine and a second dose for AstraZeneca vaccine. I've reviewed this statement and it is something that is not surprising to us. It's based on some preliminary data from a study uh, that was done in Germany with a small number of people. And what it is based on is uh, measuring of the immune system response. And it showed that people who had an mRNA vaccine after a dose of, of AstraZeneca had good or better immune markers afterwards. So this is a very small study. It adds to the information that we know. But we've weighed this data along with the real life data that we see about how well these vaccines protect us. And does that little bit of extra antibody or those, uh, the cell mediated response translate into better protection in the real world? And the answer is we don't know that yet. And we still know from the information that we're seeing both here in BC but also primarily in the UK where a lot of AstraZeneca has been used that vaccine effectiveness is very good for both AstraZeneca and the mRNA vaccines. It's important to remember that this is new information that we are continuing to learn as we use more of these vaccines around the world and as more studies are done to help us understand which, better, which um, vaccines, which combinations work better and which intervals work better. And we've talked about that a little bit before, where we've seen now that it probably works better to have a longer interval versus the short interval that was used in the uh, clinical trials early on. But the bottom line is the very real world experience and evidence shows us that we have good protection across the board with both vaccines in our community. Both approaches are highly effective, but mixing an mRNA after a dose of AstraZeneca may give some boost to the immune system, but we don't know whether that translates into whether you're better protected or not. We don't know that definitively, and we may not know that for some time. As a result, here in BC, our advice has not changed. You make the choice that is right for you because of all the vaccines that we have here in use in BC are safe and highly effective, and so are all of the options. We will continue to watch how all of these vaccines are working, and there are additional studies underway, so more information will come up, and we'll let you know if we change this information. But I think we can be very reassured that two doses of whatever vaccine you receive are safe and effective and work here in BC.
and we will continue to watch the ongoing studies about what is the optimal interval, how long does that protection last after you've got your second dose. And those are things that we'll be watching very carefully as we go into the fall. There are studies ongoing looking at whether we need a third booster dose, whether it needs to be modified a little bit to account for some of the, the different strains or variants of the virus that are circulating. And we are watching those studies very closely too. And if it does turn out that sometimes people's immune uh, response wanes or goes uh, lowers after a period of time, then we will be providing a, a third booster dose with the mRNA vaccine if needed. So these things change. We're learning as we go, and we're learning lots of very uh, useful information about how vaccines affect our immune system and how long that immunity lasts. And we will update information as we go. I just want to also say that throughout this whole pandemic, uh, our public health teams, especially our environmental health officers, have been working very closely with WorkSafe BC and played an important part in our pandemic response, supporting businesses to have the comprehensive COVID-19 safety plans that we started with our first restart program over a year ago. Those plans have been the basis that have allowed us to keep many businesses functioning, even at reduced capacity over the last two waves of this virus that we've had. These plans have helped to keep employees and workers and customers safe. Now as we move through our BC Restart Plan, we'll be taking the lessons we've gained from having these types of specific plans in place. And as we move to step three and four, businesses will be adapting these COVID-19 plans into a more general measures to keep people safe from communicable diseases in workplaces. So uh, Public Health and WorkSafe BC will help workplaces to make this transition and then we will be providing detailed guidance on these general communicable disease plans in the coming weeks. Businesses will need to have these plans in place for as we move through um, stage three and into step four. When and most importantly, will need to be in place before we hit the respiratory and other communicable disease increases that we tend to see in the fall. So COVID-19 safety plans, once we get to step three, will no longer be required except where there is elevated risk. And I do recommend that businesses look at what are the layers of protection that they can keep in place in preparation for the, the unknowns that we may be facing this fall. For example, barriers and signage and other things. Just to say, WorkSafe will have much more information um, based on the work that we're doing together with public health in the, in the next uh, couple of weeks as we look to step three. Our progress through this pandemic in BC has always been the result of us working together, doing our part and supporting others to do the same. We've done things right and we've done the right things and we need to keep going. As we bridge to brighter days of summer, Let's continue to safely restart, slowly and with respect for others, recognizing that not everybody is in the same level of comfort yet, but that we can put this pandemic behind us. Let's make sure we encourage everybody to get their immunizations. That is the tool that we have now that gets us out of this pandemic, both your first and your second dose in the coming weeks. And let's get our transmission down as much as we possibly can so we can enjoy the summer weeks ahead. And let's, of course, remember to be kind, to be calm, and to be safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry, and um, and uh, I wanted to start by acknowledging the person that passed away in the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority, as Dr. Henry has said at Richmond Hospital. It's uh, this uh, pandemic has been very hard on everybody, but obviously on families who've lost loved ones directly related to COVID-19 or lost loved ones in this pandemic uh, for many cause who uh, have not had sufficient opportunity to grieve. So I want to pass on to that family both my condolences of the government of people in BC and to their friends and their caregivers and their communities. 
Um, obviously, uh, it was another um, very strong day of immunization in BC uh, from yesterday to today, 66,729 doses uh, delivered. I want to acknowledge um, the work done by our pharmacists who are delivering uh, second doses now of AstraZeneca and in fact to date um, in the very short period of time since we opened up second doses have uh, provided 63,910 second doses and well over 300,000 overall doses to people across uh, BC of AstraZeneca. I think our pharmacists have really stepped up and done an excellent job and we are extremely grateful to them for all of, uh, all of their efforts. With respect to immunization, as Dr. Henry has said, there is, uh, has been some changes in uh, vaccine delivery from the federal government um, and will be in the month of July. And just to put that in context, um, I want to say that uh, the federal government uh, continues to work very hard uh, to deliver vaccine to BC and that our job consistently is adapt to that. Uh, as you know uh, from at the end of last week, the beginning of this week, we saw and are going to see significant new supplies of Moderna uh, vaccine. And uh, we are uh, exceptional team who deliver vaccines everywhere in BC, led by uh, Dr. Penny Ballum. Uh, we're obviously adjusting and adapting and working on that. And now we have, in terms of when vaccine is going to arrive, Pfizer vaccine going to arrive, a few more changes. And we're going to continue to adapt and to deliver this largest vaccination program in uh, BC history to people and communities across BC. Just to show this the difference in what we're seeing and expecting to see uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, next week, uh, with respect to the Moderna vaccine, first of all, um, at uh, the end of the week that we're in, 392,420 new doses. Uh, in, next week, uh, at the beginning of the week, we're expecting 378,420 doses and 382,760 doses of Moderna. So that is a significant increase. We don't have any uh, right now uh, guarantees or, or a sense of deliveries in July, but we expect obviously more Moderna in that time. So that's a significant increase in the amount of Moderna we're receiving um, in the system. With respect to Pfizer, uh, the week we're in, we've already received the 327,600 doses we expect. The week of June 21st, uh, from the federal government, we, uh, our supply is again 327,600. At the end of uh, the last week in June, starting June 28th, it will again be 328,770, so the same range. The change will be the following week, the week of July 5th. Initially, the expectation was that we'd receive a further 308,880 doses. The federal government has now indicated that we will be receiving 121,680 doses. With respect to week 31 of the campaign, which starts on July 12th, we have the same indication that we'll see a reduction in doses. And then uh, by the end of July, we'll make up those numbers. So this has some effect on what we're trying to do. But if you look at it from 10 days ago, uh, it, with uh, uh, with uh, respect for the people working so hard at the federal level to deliver doses to British Columbia and to Canada. Um, because of the increased number amount of Moderna, we're doing well. We obviously would rather have vaccine here than not, but uh, we're, we're receiving a significant amount of vaccine and this is the time, if you haven't registered, if you haven't booked, to register and to book. And in dozens and dozens of communities across BC, there are first dose, uh, walk up vaccination clinics available. So check your health authority websites because they're everywhere. And it was wonderful to see the big line of people in Fort St. John uh, this past weekend and the efforts being made by BC CDC staff, Northern Health staff, and the community in Fort St. John. I want to acknowledge uh, my colleague in the legislature, Dan Davies, for his work in assisting us with those efforts as well. And just finally, I want to just uh, bring you up to date on the most recent. Uh, uh, surgical renewal numbers. You'll know that uh, last week we reported that all nine hospitals uh, were back to full operation by June 7th. And uh, we've affirmed the commitment to get those individuals whose surgeries uh, were, were postponed. That's, that uh, commitment um, is clear that we are going to do everything we can to get those surgeries underway as soon as possible. I want to note that for the week uh, 
uh, of May 31st uh, to June the 6th, our most recent week, health authorities completed 7,471 surgeries. This was in the midst of the slowdown and it was one of the largest weeks of surgeries we've had, which is a tribute to everyone working in the health authorities. That is actually um, uh, higher than the average of the previous uh, number of months. Uh, just finally, I'd say this, that this week uh, the Premier announced our move to step two of BC's restart plan, our advancement through the four-step plan uh, to bring us all back together, and our progress in getting patients their surgeries that were postponed and fundamentally changing the way we deliver surgeries in BC are each anchored in the countless steps each of us take to make our better future possible. I want to acknowledge what everyone is doing throughout BC and continues to do. It's a step we are taking each day to build our immunity by registering for our first and second shots, by booking our appointments, and by getting our vaccinations. It's the determined steps we are taking each day to ensure our safety, including in workplaces and especially in workplaces, and protect our immunity by using our COVID skills, by following the guidance we've been given, and by adhering to the orders that help us stop the spread, by continuing to focus each and every day on the individual steps we take and collective steps we take to keep safe and stop the spread. We remove anxieties from patients by getting them the surgeries they need, and we build a welcome future that has much in store for all of us. Aujourd'hui, nous annonçons 120 nouveaux cas qui ont testé positif pour COVID-19, pour un total de 146 794 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Nous sommes attristés d'annoncer un nouveau décès lié au COVID-19 pour un total de 1739 décès en Colombie-Britannique. Nous offrons nos condoléances à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches durant cette pandémie. Parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés de COVID-19, 131 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, dont 44 en soins intensifs. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. We're happy to take your questions. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow-up. First question is Michelle Bernoro, CTV. Hi there, can you hear me? Go ahead. Hi. Um, so, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, families say access to loved ones in long-term care is still severely restricted and inconsistent from facility to facility. So when in BC's restart plan will care homes become more accessible? Yeah, so part, uh, as we've talked about a, a few times, uh, we are on a different uh, trajectory for access and support for long-term care homes. And partly that was because of the early immunization we did in care homes. And as you know, we increased um, access and visitation uh, in March. At the same time, we were putting in more restrictions in many other parts of our communities. And yes, we have heard that it is a, a, an issue not so much with what we have in place, but the fact that there's inconsistency in how the guidelines are being applied. So we have been working with health authorities to ensure that people do at least get the minimum uh, from uh, the guidelines that are in place. We're not yet at a place where we have sufficient um, protection in our communities uh, to uh, expand from there. But we will be, and we will be in the coming months as we move into later in the summer, and we're working on that even as we speak. Michelle, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. So uh, one of the complaints I keep hearing from families is that, so the family member is vac double vaccinated, the senior is double vaccinated, and yet there are still these severe restrictions. When you've got both people vaccinated, is it fair to keep them away from each other? Like, is there a reason for that? Yeah, so it is unfortunately the, the nature that we have seen in care homes where it is not just me and my loved one that is at issue. It is the fact that if we introduce it inadvertently into a care home, even when we have high levels of immunization, it can spread so easily. So yes, we are allowing for families to spend more time with their loved one, to be able to have that all important physical contact when you're in that room with your loved one. And those are things that are important right now. And yes, as transmission goes down in our communities and as more people are protected and the risk of the virus being around goes down, we'll be able to expand that as well. 
Next question, Mike Hager, Globe and Mail. Mike, are you there? Failing that, we'll move on to Richard Zussman, Global News. Do you expect uh, there will now be a lot of people resistant to get AstraZeneca because of this nasty guidance? What In that situation, what would we do with the extra doses? Are you worried that these doses could now be wasted? Yeah, so so not yet, no. I think, you know, this is um, an attempt to try and give people up-to-date information about what's going on out there. Um, as I've said, it's, it's not definitive. And we know there are many people who made that very important choice about receiving a vaccine. And they made the choice to receive AstraZeneca. And we can be assured that that was a good choice to make. The vaccine is safe and it works. And many people want to ensure that they have the same vaccine for their second dose. But this does tell us that it is certainly a, a perfectly good choice to mix and match as well. And it, we have increasing evidence of that. And it may, in some people, um, stimulate a stronger, more um, perhaps more longer lasting immune response. So you may get the best of both worlds out of that. But we don't yet know that for sure. And I would just uh, say, as I've been saying all along, you know, you've made, there's no wrong decision here. These are equally effective and uh, you can make the decision based on your own personal um, beliefs about the vaccine that you chose and the reasons that you chose that vaccine or you can choose to, to use an mRNA vaccine if you have concerns about AstraZeneca. So we have uh, a limited supply in pharmacies and it's been going very well. I know a lot of people have safely got their second dose of AstraZeneca vaccine and they, uh, it's about half and half right now with how we're going and we are titrating the vaccine that we're bringing in to make sure that we can meet the needs. And I know pharmacists are reaching out to people and we've sent around a, uh, a, a little survey as well to to, try to better understand people's intent uh, for receiving a second dose of AstraZeneca or a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. And, it, and we've been trying to titrate the vaccine that we have coming into that. Richard, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, the, the two concerns I hear about most now since this news came out a few hours ago is uh, if you're double-dosed with AstraZeneca, will you be able uh, to travel to the United States. We've already seen this Bruce Springsteen show where the guidance says that you, uh, AstraZeneca is not on the list of, of uh, vaccinations they would accept for admission. So are you concerned that there may be travel issues for people who've received AstraZeneca? The other ones are people who are, you made the point earlier about a booster. They're asking now, can I get my Pfizer or Moderna in the next few weeks? to offset the two AstraZeneca I've already received. So are, are, what do you think about the travel piece? And, and is there a thought to allow people just to get that mRNA very soon after a second AstraZeneca dose, just to be uh, sure? So maybe I'll start with the second one. And, and there's no evidence that one, it's needed, or that it provides any additional benefit to get an mRNA vaccine within a short period of time after receiving uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. We know from real world experience, so that's the vaccine effectiveness that shows that two doses of AstraZeneca in the UK, the vaccine effectiveness after two doses of AstraZeneca was exactly the same as after two doses of, of mRNA vaccines. So they work they protect you. They protect you for a long, well, that part we don't know yet. And that's where a booster may come in. We, we need to look at what happens as we go into the fall. And it may be in months from now that we'll find that immunity decreases with one or the other combinations of vaccines. And it may decrease with all of them. There's studies going on both uh, in the UK, here in Canada, in the US, looking at intervals as well. And it may be that people who got the vaccine at a shorter interval may need a booster dose sooner. So those are all the questions that we don't know answers to definitively yet, but that we will be following. So if you got two doses of AstraZeneca, you can be rest assured you got a safe and effective vaccine and that we will be monitoring that effectiveness over time. And if you need a booster dose, uh, we'll be able to provide that to you. 
So I don't think people need to be concerned about that in the short term. We'll be watching all of that very carefully in the longer term. In terms of travel, we have been uh, working internationally and of course with Canada is leading this and uh, we are feeding into that and our advice, our expectation and what we are hearing from countries around the world is that it will be WHO approved vaccines will be uh, the standard that will, someone will need to meet. And yes, we are hearing of course that uh, mixing or matching is going to be accepted in most countries around the world. These are details that are still in flux. We don't know the answers to everything yet, um, but we have heard from the, at least from my colleagues in the U.S. that AstraZeneca is, uh, will be one of the vaccine combinations that they will approve. Um, but that doesn't mean that certain businesses or certain, in this case I understand it was the uh, concert venue itself um, that made those decisions for reasons that I don't know. Um, but we we do expect that it will be the standard that WHO sets that allows us to have um, a, a measurable standard around the world. And all of the vaccines that are approved for use here in Canada and all the combinations are approved by WHO as well. Next question, Marcella Bernardo, News 1130. Hi, Dr. Henry and, and Mr. Dix. Uh, just to follow up with what Richard said, um, a little bit about the the concert venue aspect of everything. Some high profile artists have already booked performances this fall in large Vancouver venues. So could you talk us through how those events were granted approval if we're being told not to expect to gather indoors in large crowds anytime soon? And will concert goers here be expected to show proof they're fully vaccinated or wear masks? Yeah, so we've not approved any uh, large concerts or large uh, events for the fall. I know that many are have uh, planned these uh, with the expectations that certain things may be in place. Um, and I know that's uh, something that we've been working with industry on, but none of them have been approved. We have not yet uh, determined capacity limits as we're going into the summer or into the fall, but we have signaled that they will, of course, be higher than they are now. And that depending on how things go, we go hope to get back to a sense of normalcy uh, into the fall. The caveat, of course, being that we don't yet know what's going to happen in next respiratory season and we may need to pull back on some of the measures or at least on a local level institute some uh, different measures to try and prevent transmission of infections. So there's a big unknown still yet, but none of those have been approved for use, uh, approved for uh, uh, for going ahead and I know there was a couple that were being advertised for uh, uh, early in June and and you know there's reasons why promoters uh, don't cancel until uh, closer to the date when they have better understanding of what uh, actually restrictions are going to be in place. And Marcella. sorry Marcella I missed there was some <laughs> there was another part to that question that I'm not sure I answered. Um. The, the other part was whether or not people are going to be expected to be fully vaccinated or wear a mask. But my, if I can still have my second question, um, if you could please tell us if any of the people now testing positive for the virus or who have died this week were fully vaccinated and possibly commit to regularly reporting that information like other provinces do? Uh, in terms of whether you have to have proof of vaccination to attend events here, that's not something that we will, that I support from a public perspective. Um, so I know individual businesses and organizations may, uh, are looking at that, but there are legal and other ramifications to that as well. Um, it, it, yes, we do report on breakthrough and uh, so I can sort of answer those questions. Um, I do get regular reports and we are following it, um, but not on an individual basis. We do know it for outbreaks, for example, and uh, uh, the, the individual clinician looking after somebody will be able to say, I can tell you what percentage of our cases are people who have had uh, within 21 days of first dose and, uh, or seven days of second dose. And I don't have it in front of me today, although I was looking at it just yesterday. But it's, uh, but I can get you those numbers. Uh, the uh, the one person who died today, as far as I understand, was not immunized. The the rate of infection and the risk of hospitalization and uh, and ICU and death is still much much higher in people who are non-immunized versus immunized. 
But as the number of people who are immunized and the proportion of population immunized goes up, the absolute numbers of people who get infected um, who have been immunized will go up as well. But thankfully, as our numbers come down, that still is a very small number of people. Um, but I can provide you that information. And yes, uh, um, I know we were looking at how to report that out on a regular basis, and uh, I'll work with the BCCDC to do that. Next question, Nick Johansson, Castanet. Hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, here in the interior, uh, daily cases have been dropping much slower compared to the rest of the province. Uh, I guess today, I believe, it, uh, interior cases made up 35 percent of the total province numbers. Um, do we know wh why this is the case, and uh, and where in the region in particular, uh, and in what situations are this uh, is this transmission continuing to to occur? Yeah, so that is something I've been uh, talking with my colleagues in Interior Health about, and uh, we've been working hard to try and, and figure it out. And really, it, it is not one thing. There are certain communities, and we can see that in the data on the dashboard, where rates are higher, but it's moving around. And it's uh, clusters of cases that uh, that happen in smaller communities get transmission. The transmission um, comes under control. But really, the central Okanagan has been uh, a bit of a hot spot for a while in different communities in that area. We know that Grand Forks had a, a cluster of cases and transmission in the school, etc. So it, it really is a little bit all over the place, which makes us, it's so important that we get immunization rates up in every community and that we continue to pay attention to, um, to those measures that prevent transmission, making sure we get tested if we have any concerns at all, and, uh, and public health is following up with people to try and stop those chains of transmission. We know what we need to do, um, but sometimes we get a little bit complacent, and particularly where in communities where immunization rates aren't that high yet, um, it can spread very quickly. Nick, do you have a follow-up? Just on the subject of, of vaccinations, uh, are we seeing any particular vaccine hesitancy in any of the smaller communities up here in the in the Okanagan and, and wider interior? I've noticed on the on the dashboard that there's some uh, some communities where vaccination rates are hovering uh, around the mid 50% for for adults still. Yeah, and we've been looking at that at different communities around the province. And yeah, there are some communities, and it's different in different places. There's very few people um, that are absolutely against immunization, and sometimes they're very vocal. But what we are finding is, as I've said this before a few times, there's a number of reasons. One of them is confidence in the vaccine, and that is part of our uh, making sure people have the information they, that they need, that they understand uh, the safety profile, how well it works, all of those things that people want to know to make sure that they're making the right choice for them and their family. Um, so we're spending a lot of time with different community leaders and making sure we have information in the right language that supports people and that they can get those questions answered. The other one is uh, complacency, and, uh, and this is certainly an issue in some communities where they have not had a whole lot of, of COVID-19 and they haven't been exposed to how challenging and terrifying and, and horrible this virus can be if it gets into a community and makes people really sick. So there is a level of complacency in some areas, and we need to combat that by uh, bringing vaccine to people and making it easy for them to get it. And that's the third one. It's around convenience. And we do know that for some people it's a really big deal to actually register and then book an appointment and you have to go somewhere. So that's why we're doing all of these uh, new initiatives that uh, the minister was talking about, um, drive through, uh, bringing pop-up clinics to smaller communities. And there's some really great uh, ones being done uh, with the BC Automobile Association and moving around to different communities in, uh, in the interior and also in the north. And we'll be doing more of that um, in many communities, making it easy for people to just get the vaccine. Just want to encourage people at interior and in, living in interior health. I, I think interior health, uh, um, talking to the CEO Susan Brown and the team there, is making a very significant effort to do, uh, especially focusing on first doses and raising first dose immunization. Because in general, second dose immunization is slightly higher in northern health than interior health, but that, in some respects, reflects first dose immunization. We want to raise that up, and we've seen real progress in. Uh, 
in communities uh, such as Rutland and other communities where we saw lower rates now where those rates are uh, coming much more back to normal. We have to keep going in those efforts, but I really encourage people in the interior to go to the Interior Health website, that the, it is absolutely important to register and to book your vaccination. But for, for many people, there are opportunities to get vaccinated, particularly with first dose. Uh, right now, there will be through this weekend, through next week. There is, as we mentioned, more uh, Moderna vaccine being made available, and a, a significant portion of that is for first dose and providing access, easy access to people who need first doses. So if you live anywhere in BC, but particularly in interior health and northern health, uh, this is the time to get vaccinated. And all of the, all of the things that come with it, the, it's, it's really a gift to our lives. It makes us health safer, it makes the ones we love safer, it makes our communities safer, and it's going to allow us, as we all know, to do things that we, that we would otherwise not be able to do. So this is the time to get vaccinated, and I'm very thankful to all of the communities who are working with us in, across Interior Health to see that that happens. Next question is Craig Takuchi, Georgia Strait. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, just following up on that question about the, the interior health, um, Vancouver Coastal Health used to have the second most cases, but there has been a steep decrease over the past month um, to, to the point now that Vancouver Coastal Health has been registering lower than interior health. Um, is there anything in particular that Vancouver Coastal Health is doing effectively considering we're much more densely populated? Or anything like that? Yeah, all uh, all communities are doing all, all kinds of things, and uh, we had uh, issues uh, more recently where cases started to go up again in places like the downtown east side. So, making sure we could bring second doses and first doses back to people and the opportunities to be immunized in those communities. Uh, Richmond was also an area where we had uh, low. Uh, lower immunization and focusing on working with that community has made a huge difference. I, I think it's um, you know the fact that we focused on getting access to vaccination for the people who can who were working in um, areas where they couldn't work from home. And I know Vancouver Coastal did this very early on. Uh, everything from uh, grocery store workers to first responders to making sure that young people who work in the hospitality industry got access to vaccine. And that's been really, really effective. Where we have seen transmission in countries around the world, and I think about the UK and, and the rapid increase they've had in uh, with the new, more transmissible virus circulating, it's, it often is in young people. And we know that younger people have a lot more contacts with each, with people in the same age group. And then we can get spillover into older people who are more at risk of being in hospital or having severe illness. So there was a lot of concerted effort, both in Fraser and in Vancouver Coastal, to make sure that we could um, get vaccine available to uh, younger workers who need it to go into work and have those contacts and I think they've been very very successful and it, it uh, you know I look at Whistler as well and uh, one of my colleagues who works in the immunization clinic up there and they I think they immunize 2,000 people in a day and it is in for second doses for most of them so ha taking that community approach and uh, ensuring that there's access makes a big difference Craig do you have a follow-up uh, yes thanks um, also, over the past few months, uh, a number of gyms have been listed amongst the businesses temporarily closed by health authorities uh, due to COVID. Um, I was just wondering, with high-intensity fitness starting up again, and now with immunizations and variants in the mix, um, is there anything that gym us users should be wary or cautious of, or was there anything that those gyms that were closed down, um, was there anything that they were failing to do or any common issues amongst them? So there, there's a there's a whole bunch of things. You know, we we had uh, a lot of places that stayed open um, as long as we possibly could with the COVID safety plans in place. And I talked a little bit about this earlier. But uh, we recognized that with the the newer, more transmissible variants, we had less leeway, less wiggle room for safety. And it was those high intensity uh, workouts and you know some of them which were lifelines for people um, in. A 
small enclosed area where the ventilation may not have been good and it could spread so, so quickly. So we saw that in a lot of places. So for the most part, people had good safety plans, but the level of risk went up so dramatically when we had so much more transmission in the community and in younger people who may not have got that sick themselves so felt it was still okay to go into the gym and have that workout. So uh, there was many different reasons and it can be quite uh, specific to specific sites. But in general, uh, when we had a lot of transmission in the community, those environments where you were uh, closer together, where people were working hard, where there was a lot of, of um, virus in the air meant that things were no, no longer safe in those environments and it could transmit very easily. We're moving into a place where people are immunized. Um, where we can put uh, increased space so it's not full on back into those crowded classes for sure. And we need to remember that we are still a little bit at risk, which means um, if you're not feeling well, you should not go. If you've been exposed to anybody, you should not be going. If there's people in your social circle that have COVID, then you need to be really careful and not go into those high risk environments right now and get tested. We have time for one more question. For everyone listening, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix will release a statement this afternoon with the latest information on vaccinations, cases, and hospitalizations, which you can find at news.gov.bc.ca. For our last question, we go to Zara Premji, CBC. Dr. Henry, an 81-year-old man in the Fraser Health region is dealing with a mix-up regarding his second dose. So essentially he says he hasn't received it, but the health authority says he has. Now I understand you can't comment on a specific issue, but generally is there any harm in receiving an additional dose of the vaccine if there is any doubt about whether or not you have received two? And would a third dose be bad for your health? Yeah, and the, and the short answer is no. And, you know, it is unfortunate. Sometimes these mix up happens. You know, we've, we're, I think I said today we're over 4 million doses of vaccine given and uh, even 60,000 doses yesterday. So um, sometimes, unfortunately, people get mixed up. And no, there's no uh, harm to one's health. There's no risk for getting a, a, a third dose. Um, it won't. Um, count as a, a third dose essentially. It just is the, the same. Um, if you get them too close together, it's, your body doesn't recognize it as more than one. So, But there's no adverse effects that we know of. Um, there can be uh, an increased uh, sore arm and, and a local reaction if you're getting a second uh, a dose too soon. Um, but that would be the extent of it really. Zara, do you have a follow-up? Yes, thank you. Dr. Henry, can you give advice for people who received AstraZeneca about how long they should wait after their first dose to get their mRNA vaccine if that's what they choose? And you've mentioned a longer interval between doses might be valuable. So can you define longer? Is that eight weeks or 12 weeks? And can we also get that answer in French as well, please? Oh, I wish I could. I wish it was black and white. But uh, what, uh, what we can say uh, is that we, we don't actually know what the optimal interval is yet. But there is mounting evidence, and I think most of us would agree, that the interval, the short interval of three or four weeks that was used in the, um, in the clinical trials is probably not the optimal interval. But whether it, there's evidence uh, to say that eight weeks is better than 10 weeks or 10 weeks is better than 12 weeks or 12 weeks is better than eight weeks, that we don't yet know. And we don't yet know I, for other um, other series of, of vaccines for, against viruses like hepatitis and others, it, it actually is better, longer lasting if you get it about six months. But we have not yet had these vaccines for that period of time to be able to know how long immunity lasts. So um, the bottom line is it's somewhere probably anywhere between eight to 12 weeks is what we are using right now is probably better than the four weeks. But somewhere in there is okay. And uh, so I can reassure people that are up to 16 weeks and uh, that there's also data that shows that that's just as good too. Your body doesn't lose its um, immunity in that short period of time. And that is a short period of time in terms of us, our, our body's immune response. So um, even up to, to four months or six months, um, we, we haven't measured up to six months yet, but even up to four months, we know that that first dose gives you good immunity. 
Um, and you might even get a more durable, longer lasting uh, effect after a longer interval. And we've seen that in some older people, but again, it's only measuring the immune response. It doesn't tell us about protection in the real world. But protection in the real world does seem to be a little bit better if you waited a little longer between those doses. And I know um, we were talking with our colleagues from the U.S. and, and that's why they are spending a lot of time looking at, at uh, booster doses because most of the people in the U.S. received uh, the vaccine at a very short interval. So that may mean that they need a booster dose sooner. We don't know that for sure yet. Um, but I can just reassure people that anywhere um, six weeks, eight weeks, up to 16 weeks is all safe and will all work and the longer is not going to harm you in any way. Oui, effectivement, ce que euh, la Dr. Henry vient de dire, c'est que la différence entre 10 ans et 8 semaines, 10 semaines, 12, euh, 12 semaines, 14 semaines, euh, n'est pas tellement important. Il faut avoir des deux doses, ça c'est essentiel. On commence en général à vous contacter euh, euh, vers la huitième semaine après la première dose. Et je pense que c'est normal qu'il y ait une attente après cela. Par exemple, euh, dans mon propre cas, euh, j'ai attendu huit semaines et j'ai fait euh, et je vais avoir euh, la deuxième dose de vaccin euh, dans le mois de juillet, euh, quatre euh, semaines, quatre à cinq semaines après euh, j'ai été notifié. Donc ça c'est tout à fait normal. Des gens peuvent avoir euh, confiance euh, que de poursuivre cela jusqu'à 16, 17, 18 semaines ne fait pas une grande différence. Ce qui est important, ce qui est essentiel pour tout le monde. Pour, pour vous et pour tout ce que vous aimez, c'est d'avoir votre première dose, d'attendre un certain temps et puis d'avoir une deuxième dose. Uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you. OK. <laughs> And sorry, I didn't specifically answer the question about uh, how long to wait for your mRNA. Um, but I can tell you that it seems to be the same, whether you get Pfizer, Pfizer, Moderna, Moderna, AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca, or AstraZeneca mRNA. And the one study that uh, NASI referred to that looked at um, mixing uh, with AstraZeneca and then Pfizer, the average interval was, uh, was around 10 or 11 weeks. So it, it does work well um, to have that interval uh, a bit longer for any of the combinations that we have. Thank you. Thank you.